success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio with us today here in Nashville, Tennessee, we've actually been trying to get this gentleman on the show for quite a while. Yeah, it's been, I think, over a year at least. But uh, at just, least we got you here now. Yeah, praise God. Uh, not, not that I didn't want to, just the times just never seemed to match. When you guys were open, I wasn't, and vice versa. The schedules just didn't seem to fit until now. Yeah. But it's, it's good that you're here. Let me read a little bit about what you've accomplished over the years. You started out, I think, in high school with a band playing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, went on to college to get your degree in civil engineering. Yes. And during that time, you had a band, but then you joined a group that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, left that group, I think, in 1980, it was? Yes. I actually got fired from that group in 1980, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. (laughs) Went on to become the lead singer of a multi-Grammy Award winning, Mm -hmm. Dove Award winning, Gold Award, I should say, RIAA certified Gold Award winning albums, inducted into the Hard Rock Cafe Mm -hmm. uh, in 1994, also inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame in 2000, and simultaneously had four albums in this on the SoundScan charts. It, you know what? Uh, That just means we've been around for a long time. Been around. (laughs) John Schlitt is joining us. Thank you for uh, sitting in the uh, in the guest seat today with us. It's my pleasure, buddy. Absolutely. So I want to start at the very beginning. We we talked a little bit about. You had a band in high school, and and I always ask this question with our guests. Who were your musical influences back in those days? Back then, Beatles, of course, Um, the Turtles. Ah. Um, uh, Oh, shoot. Um, All the singing groups, the the, the groups that were rocking, but always had a lot of vocals. Um, And I I love that. I love three-part harmonies. Um, I love guitars. I loved, I lo- but I also really enjoyed keyboards. I saw the value of a keyboard that can do anything from being an orchestra in the background to being a piano, you know, to uh, rocking things down. So uh, any group that, was, that would fit that, that category, I was, uh, it was my cup of tea. Were you a musician in the beginning? Did you take any kind of formal like piano lessons or guitar lessons as a kid growing up? Well, I, you're primarily known as a singer. Yes, uh, I played piano for a little bit. I fought it all the way. My parents wanted me to take piano lessons, so I did. But I fought it. I finally fought it to where I didn't have to take it anymore. And then a good buddy of mine um, decided he was going to play guitar. And I said, well, if you're going to play guitar, I'm going to play guitar. So we went to the same, the same teacher, and then we finally went to her teacher and learned enough, learned enough chords to where we start our own band. And that was about three. You know, you get three chords, you can play just about uh, oh, 80% of all the music was out at the time. Back in those days, Amen. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so we started our own band called the Vinegar Hill Hometown Band Something Different. <laughs> and that's a long story in itself. We don't have enough time now. But but uh, went on through high school with that. Actually did real well. Um, it was funny. Um I had to show the keyboard player how to play keyboard parts. I had to pull, show the lead guitar player how to play lead guitar parts. And and what's funny was I, I wasn't that good in either one of them, but I would just always sit by the record and pick out the parts and, and do that. And notice I said record. I didn't say CD or cassette. Right, right. Um, and it was, it was fun. And the reason I was a singer is because nobody else would. I wanted, I wanted to play uh, rhythm guitar. And maybe sing a little bit and have a have a front guy, but no one would ever do it. So I had to sing lead. And then when I went to college, I tried out for a frat band that needed an acoustic, uh, a, a rhythm guitar player that could sing. So I tried out, and uh, they had a big meeting. You know, I played guitar and I sang, and they had a big meeting. Came back, says, "Okay, our lead singer plays better, acu- uh, 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 you know, rhythm guitar than you do, but you sing better than he does." So from now, we don't want you to play any guitar. Just want you to sing, and that's when I realized that uh, you know, I'd I'd hit my limit, and my guitar playing was pretty bad. 
uh, my keyboard playing, I wouldn't even do it in front of anybody. And so uh, at that time, you could be a lead singer, and uh, there was a lot, a lot of lead singers that didn't play guitar or, or keyboards. And so I became a lead singer. While in college, and, and as I mentioned in the beginning, you were studying to be a civil engineer, mm-hmm. I take it. Yep. Uh, but the music bug definitely oh, had bit it you. Was, it was there. from When I left my band in high school, um, in my freshman year, I did nothing but study. I was scared to death that I was going to flunk out. You hear there, oh, you, that first year, you're going to flunk out no matter. Uh, so I, I actually took uh, college seriously and did real good my freshman year. But my, the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, I ran into this band that turned out to be the band called Head East. Right. And that summer, oh my gosh, we we just clicked. We had everything we needed, and we be, we went from a sock hop band, which is, again, for us old timers, we know that what that means. All you kids have no idea, but that's okay. Um, and it went from that to being a big uh, college bar band in about a four-state area. Well, that was great during the summer, but it didn't stop during the summer, and I started my sophomore year in college, and I was never in college. You know, we were playing all over the place, and I would try to drive back home to t- get an 8 o'clock class and sleep through that. And uh, make a long story short, my sophomore year, I went from probation on the first semester to double probation on the second <laughs> semester. I finally had to quit the band. I said, guys, I promised my parents I was going to get a degree. I've got to do that first. Well, you know, we're going to be big by the time you finish college. I said, you probably will. But they went through about 50, about, oh, you know, I wanted about 25 different people in that three years period where I was in college. And the day I took my last final exam, I was on stage back with what they called Head East at that time, which had had morphed into something really weird. And we lasted about six months. And then the band broke up. And I finally said, okay, now we've stopped playing games. Let's get the band that was part of, well, let's get the band that was part of the band when I just before I left, got everybody back together, had a meeting, said, listen, we were winning. Let's do it again. And so, um, except for the fact that we had to change a guitar player uh, who ended up writing Never Been Any Reason, with it, which is a classic and Love Me Tonight. He pretty much was the guy who wrote a lot of the major songs for us. Um, we started the band over again, and uh, it just, we went from, uh, again, playing in bar, college bars, but we also started doing original stuff right away, uh, did our own record, uh, produced it ourselves, financed it ourselves in 2000, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1975, uh, didn't come out till 76, um, and when it came out, it all... Well, all we saw it as is a demo album instead of a demo tape. And we were trying to sell the album to get our money back and send it out to all the labels. And we sent it to a couple of radio stations. Actually, a ma- our future management got a hold of it and said, oh, my gosh, this is a hit record. And sent it to some major radio stations that were breakout stations at the time. And it went number one in both stations instantly in the Midwest. And all of a sudden, we're getting calls from record companies to come and see us. And that was the beginning in, I guess, 76 of a, of a musician's dream. Uh, and it went on for four years to a point of, I don't know if I was ever home. And I had a family at that time. And it's funny, you'll have a, if, even if you have a dream, if you do, do do the dream over and over it every night, it gets old and it's never enough. So what happened with me was the, the backstage temptations um, hit me heavy duty. I went in with an attitude of I didn't want to do anything except play music. I didn't think I'd be in it too long. Then I would do my my use my degree and be a normal person. Well, it didn't happen that way. And uh I fell in with uh, cocaine became a very important thing to me. Uh, I started drinking a whole lot to where my life really depended on how much coke I had, how much booze was was around. And in 1980, uh, and I mean, we were touring everywhere. You know, in one one thing, and the crowds were great to us. 
but backstage it was a different ball game right. and uh the band finally fired me because i was just too messed up and uh which is funny i mean it's not like they were angels either but uh <laughs> uh got fired in 80 went on a binge for about six months creating my own band called the johnny band to a point where did you do that one with your brother yeah 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 it was a it was a good little band i mean i got uh Musicians out of um, the East Coast, uh, out of Milwaukee, including my brother, my brother, a great, a great, actually a very good band. Uh, but I never get a chance because I was, I, I used that six months just to stay either drunk or coked up for just about 24 hours a day. And uh, at the end of that, I, one time I woke up and a little voice says, you know, you're worth more dead than alive. And I believed it. I sat in my chair. So you know what? Not going to use a gun. I had a five-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son. I didn't want them to see a mess. So as I'm sitting here trying to figure out what kind of pills I could use to make it quick and painless, my wife taps me on the shoulder and says, now she had become a Christian during this same period that I was uh, um, going on my binge. She right. became a Christian. And she would try to tell me about Christ, and I would go, oh, get on my face. I'll, I'll be a Christian when I'm too old to have fun. You know, just typical that uh, uh, that you run into in the world. And uh, she says, you promised you'd come talk to my pastor tonight. And I said, when? It says, last night when you were drunk. I said, okay. So I went there with an attitude, knowing what I was going to do. I came out with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Changed my life. Wow. Yeah. Changed my life. Uh, still wasn't in music. I, I wasn't in music for another five years. I figured that, uh, you know, I got... I. I worked in a mining construction company um, for five years, and uh, um, and I thought that was it. You know, I thought uh, no more music. Okay, that's cool. I'm too old to be a rocker, so I'm. This is what I'm supposed to do now. And Bob Hartman called me, and by this time I'm a big Petra fan. I'm uh, somebody handed me a Petra record once and said, "This sounds just like your old record, old band, but but Christian." I said, "Yeah, right." And it did. And I thought, oh, man, if I could have only, only done it that way, if I could only done it that way. And all of a sudden, he calls me, says, uh, you know who I am? I says, oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of yours. He says, uh, would you consider singing for Petra? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And he says, well, don't you think you should pray about it? I said, yeah, but I knew. Yeah. I knew. How about six uh, about six months later, I was singing for the fir first time sober in seven years in front of about 6,000 people in Brisbane, Australia. And that was the beginning of 20 years of solid touring, writing, ministry that was t totally mind-boggling. Took five of the weirdest guys, put us together, and watched s uh, miracles happen for 20 years. We're going to take a break, get a word in for at least one of our sponsors. And then when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with John Schlitt and this amazing, fantastic, phenomenal journey that he's been on. You're listening to the business side of music. When you have a cord synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, Wave sequencing or the multi-engine synth. Core gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Back in the studio on the show with us today, John Schlitt, who, along with being uh, the lead singer of Head East mm -hmm. and the other band, uh, what was the name of that band again? That band was called Petra, yes. No, I meant the, 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 oh, the, oh, oh, oh. the one that's about a mile long. Yeah, uh, Vinegar Hill's hometown band, Something Different. Actually, it was Something Different, but I always loved Vinegar Hill's hometown band. And that. I came from a little town called Mount Pulaski. It was in Illinois. It's about, about in the middle of Illinois. And it used to be, for all the uh, gangsters in Chicago, 
they could come down at the station in Mount Plastic, come up to the square, and the square at one time, it was built on top of a, of a hill, um, and the square was nothing but bars. Illegal, but still bars. Right. And so it was called Vinegar Hills. Ah. Huh. So that's, um, that's how I got the name. But then you did go on to join the group Petra. Yes. Which really, I think, put the Christian music industry, not just the scene, but the industry really put them on their ear. Who are these guys? What are they doing? You, you as a band, especially during your tenure, broke through so many barriers and walls. I mean, you reached an audience that was secular. Well, that was our goal. I mean, our goal was to reach as many people as possible. We wanted, back then, the uh, radio and cars had five push buttons. And there were stations out there, Christian stations, that were really trying to compete with other secular stations. And what we wanted to do, and a lot, and several other Christian bands too, uh, wanted to give them ammunition to where those stations could play our music and compete with the secular side of things. Uh, you know, rock and roll is rock and roll. It's an exciting music form, very exciting music form. The only, the only thing is the enemy knew it way long before we've seemed to figure it out, and they were using to full potential. And uh, I wanted to take that exciting music form and sing about the most exciting subject of the history of mankind, Jesus Christ. And there was no reason, I saw no reason why not to do that. And the rest of the guys, the men had the same vision. So with the label Christian Rockers, there's two important label. There's two important uh, uh, camps we belong to. First of all, that's Christian, being Christ-like, being as godly as we can be, uh, sharing the word as much as possible. But also calling ourselves rockers. We better be the best rockers that we can be. Not second best, not good enough, but the best. Competing with all the secular sides, all the secular counter uh, parts, but with about one tenth the budget. But with the Holy Spirit, we could do that. Yeah. You had contemporaries out there around the same time. Striper, I think, would be yeah. a good example. That was, although I would consider them a hair band where you guys were more rock and rollers. Well, I'll tell you what, we are buddies. And um, they will say, hey, you want best, best rock band, Petra. We will say the best uh, uh, heavy metal band, Striper. And so we sort of have our genres in there. And... Uh, um, they're amazing. Uh, Mike's a sweetie pie. Uh, Oz. I mean, all the guys in, in Striper are good guys. Uh, they have their they have their ways of doing things, and we had our ways of doing things. And I think we respect each other. Were you surprised by not only the success of the album sales, but also the the Grammy nominations and awards? I mean, the Doves, you almost kind of anticipate going to oh, happen. Oh, I think the Doves, I was more surprised really? with than Grammys. Oh, when I first joined the band, um, my biggest shock was I thought we'd come in and the church would back us 100% be excited about us being part of the team. And the world, or the you know the secular side of things, would say, what a, oh man, get out of my face. I don't, I don't want to hear this Jesus stuff. Well, got it was totally reversed. I mean, we were getting picketed at churches by other churches. Were you really? Oh, I was like, what's going on? And in the the secular, they'd go, well, not a bad band, but I just don't like what they got to say. Yeah. So I think sometimes we were more respected in the secular world than we were in, in the Christian side of things. Now, that changed as time went on, especially after our Praise and Worship album. And uh, but so I. I wasn't surprised about the Grammys, but I was surprised about the Doves. When we first, when we got our first Dove, got to remember we were we were nominated for Dove Awards forever, and we were always looked over, always. It's along with the the Garmin Key, we used to have a joke: the most nominated, no winnings band in the <laughs> in the country, you know. Um, and I remember getting the 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 first Dove Award. We got four that night. And I'm going, oh, my God. In fact, Louie says to Dana, or no, to uh, Eddie, DeGroma says, Eddie, we're not part of the club anymore. <laughs> so um, it was, it was uh, exciting. It was exciting. 
Did you find secular radio would play your music? No way. It was pretty much limited to Christian radio. No, especially us. We were very synonymous for being a Christian band. Yeah. Uh, Our messages were never watered down at all. I had no intention of doing so. I so it wasn't like we said, well, God. No, we said Jesus. And and our our secular side of the industry the, at that time was A&M Records says, can't you just say God? Can't you just change it to God? And no, that that was we're not we weren't singing about uh, just if you say God, it can be anybody. It, it's the typical just God, the big guy in the sky. It's it's it's. Un, um, it just doesn't, doesn't get across the message that we wanted to get across. But then you had groups like the Doobie Brothers. Jesus is just all right with mm-hmm. me. They weren't afraid to use it. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm assuming their record label was okay with it. Uh, well, they got away with it. Yeah. yeah. It was a B-side of a record. Yeah. And uh, wound up becoming a hit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, that, but they weren't, see, they weren't known as a Christian band. Right. They were. Uh, that's how you get all the rhythm blues people singing about about God, Jesus all day long, and they can get away with it all day long because that's culturally accepted. A bunch of white guys singing about Jesus was totally taboo, and uh, but we didn't care. It was what we were supposed to do, and it cl- oh, it slammed a lot of doors in our face. Again, like I said, secular radio um, at the time, um, MTV. <laughs> No possible way. And we had some decent videos. It just, there's no way. What types of of shows were you performing? Were you at mainstream venues or were you at churches or was it both? And, uh, for a certain time period, we were doing all major, major vest, uh, uh, you know, four or 5,000 seat halls, yeah. and which was good for us because it was non-threatening. All the churches could join together with it. You go and play at a church, all of a sudden it's like, hold it. No, you're at so and so's church. We're not coming, right. you know, which is a shame. It's a uh, being part of Petra. We got to see the very the major pluses and the major negatives of of the body of Christ. Yeah, it's all the same God. Oh, absolutely. And, at least it should be. Oh, it, well, if you're calling yourself a Christian, you don't have an option. I'm right. Christ, Jesus yeah. Christ. I mean that it the idea of dividing because you don't like the color of the carpet of the church of the building. Just it just it's saddening to me. Yeah. You stayed with Petra through its retirement. Oh yes, yeah. We the, we played uh, two shows uh, New Year's Eve on two thousand five, two thousand six. That was our last official Petra shows. Right. Was there a reason for the band to retire at mm-hmm. that point? There sure was. We did an album called uh, Jekyll and Hyde. The last album we did, it was probably no second to the last album. It was probably the rockinest album we'd done in a long time. And we couldn't, there wasn't a station in the U.S., in the Christian station in the U.S. would play us. And there, it was a rockin' album. And we went out and we toured it heavy duty the year it came out. I mean, we played everywhere we possibly could. Uh, and the beginning of that next year, nobody, no festivals, nobody wanted Petra. And we said, okay. Uh, we've had an amazing run with over two or three, shoot, four generations. Uh, nobody wants us anymore. We can't pay our guys. Um, uh, so it's over. And so Bob, call, and by this time, I'm sort of anxious to start my solo career again anyway. But I wasn't going to do it until Bob basically said, I think it's done. And this is Bob Hartman. Bob Hartman, right. Yeah. By this time, he and I were partners in the band. And he called me up and said, John, Band's over. I said, "Why do you say that?" He says, "Well, um, we went out. There's not, there's not a festival going to ha- have us, and and that's a pretty. You know, we had two shows in June. I think he says, let's just do the two shows in June, and then we're done.' This was like in February, March, and I said, "That sounds good to me, buddy." Uh, really, it was. I was very. It was. Uh, it felt right, and uh, but we had one more record to do for. Uh, for the label that we were on at the time. But the truth was, we weren't that happy with the label, so we weren't sure if we are going to do it anyway. But we finally said, you know, I, I hung up the phone, I thought about it, and said, well, one of the reasons why Petra's attendance has been, I think, down, because by this time I'm doing solo stuff, and I'm getting, a, you know, my shows are doing pretty good. I think it's because Petra was there every year. We toured every year. So... 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, it was almost like, oh, I can't make it to Pet Love Petra, but you know what? I'll see him next year. So I said, I called Bob and said, you know what? Let's do, we have one more record. Let's do a farewell record and let's do a farewell tour for the purpose of anybody who wants to see us for that last time can come and see us. And that, oh my gosh, and that was 2005. And that tour, it was, it went great. Probably one of the best tours we had in a long time. <laughs> and, um, but it was great because we actually probably signed autographs longer than we had a show. Every night was we'd do a show and we'd sit down and sign autographs. And I'm not kidding. The show was like an hour and 45 minutes. We were signed for at least two hours. Wow. Where people would come in and, and say, this happened to me at a Petra concert or because of this. And I, I want to apologize to you. I wouldn't let my kids come to your show. But I've got my grandkids because I discovered you guys are for real. All these kind of things were, were so amazing. So that was um, a real exciting time. That was a, But that was the end. But we did give ourselves an out and say if there's a revival or a benefit where people would want us to play, we could do that if, if everyone is available. And, uh, and that went on for, year, for several years, especially in South America and then some in Europe. Um, and then the 50th anniversary came along. And Bob calls me and says, meanwhile, I'm doing my solo career. I'm with Jay Secular Band. I'm working with Billy Smiley with a thing called the Union Centers and Saints. Uh, I've got a new record out, uh, <laughs> oldest new record I've ever had called Go that I want to tour, which I still haven't been able to do yet. But Bob calls and says, you know, it's going to be 50 years our anniversary. Maybe we should go out and do it. I said, you know, that'd be fun. <laughs> and we did eight shows last year in 2002, which was the year that Petra, the name Petra started uh, 50 years ago. And they were amazing. I mean, it, it was fun. And all of a sudden we're getting calls left and right from, so we're probably going to do it this year. And possibly next year, because uh, that's when the first album came out on, in uh, 50 years from 2004. So it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time. We're going to take another break, get another word in for one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to continue to have some conversation with John Schlitt. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook. 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, sitting across the podcast table from me, John Schlitt, who for many, many years, was the lead singer of Petra, and sounds like he still is, uh, when time permits. Yep. Uh, as long as uh, as long as long the uh, opportunities come across, to, it's always fun to be with those guys. Always. But you had something interesting happen. You released a project called Go. Yes. And it came out possibly at about the worst time anybody could ever release an album yeah. and not be able to get out and promote it. You <laughs> yeah. beat, I think you beat COVID pandemic by about two weeks. Actually, if it was, if it was two weeks, I, I think it was more like a week. Wow. And um, talk about take a brand new record that you love and put it on the shelf. That's tough to do. How long had you worked on that project before you released it? Through a whole year. I, I used three, three different uh, production teams and all of them great. Um, uh, the financing this time was easier. I had I had some uh, good people helping me out, so that wasn't a problem. But just getting the people I wanted to use were all busy, 
COVID hadn't hit yet. Right. So that was a very busy year, 2019. And so I had to squeeze between their schedules and it was a balancing act. And it was, uh, but it was fun. Um, a lot of fun, actually. In fact, this record, my biggest fear was I wasn't going to be able to compete with the record I had before, which was uh, The Greater Cause. I loved that record. I thought it was amazing. And I was worried that this next record wasn't going to be as good. And when it was finished, you know, again, it was a year's flow. I'd forgotten what we did the first couple of months, you know, and when we put it all together, it was like, whoa, this is a stomping record. And I was very happy with it. Very disappointed. We had shows already uh, planned out. I had my band sort of not quite all put together yet, but I had a a core that I was going to use. And bam, it just collapsed, closed down. And that, and I thought, well, next year, next year was worse. The year after that, it was like, and then meanwhile, I've got other projects going on with a, a thing called the Union of Sinners and Saints. I got an album that came out called uh, One More Shot. And then the Jay Seculo band is keeping me busy uh, um, all the time. The Union of Sinners and Saints is a little different flavor, a little different style. Uh, well, it, it's Billy Smiley of Whiteheart and myself, and the two different sounds of Petra and Whiteheart getting together and writing was actually pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's uh, got the drive of Petra, but it's got those background vocals that, that Whiteheart was really uh, um, noticed for. Not Petra wasn't noticed for, or, you know, was well known for their their vocals too, but Whiteheart was more of a artsy type of thing where Petra was more rock in your face type. And the, the combination is really cool. I mean, uh, that was another one that went through through for almost a year, almost a little more than a year. And it was uh, sort of all added together at the end. It's like, whoa, it's, it's so much fun when you're able to do that. And it all comes together and you go, this is good. So I've got two records right now. I'm, I'm working there and a, and a Petra tour. So it's, uh, it, it keeps me busy. On the the Go album, you mm-hmm. did you co-wrote every song, I take co-wrote it? Co-wrote every song, which was uh, actually a first for me. And you had some good co-writers oh, with you, didn't you? Yeah, I had uh, my son-in-law, Dan Needham, plus uh, all our guitar players. Uh, I Please don't ask me to name them all. They, they just, uh, usually with Dan, we had six songs we did, and we used a different guitar player um, for each two songs. Each guitar player played two songs, were part of it. And we would, the three of us would co-write those two songs. And it was really, it, you know, we don't, these guys are A artists. They've been around forever. They've got these ideas that have been churning in them and to give them a chance to bring it out. They're like, this is so cool. So it was um, a lot of fun doing that. And then, then John, John Lowry, um, my keyboard player for Petra for years is a good, real good buddy of mine. And we worked on three songs there. Actually, John was more of well, totally a Petra sound because I mean, and but a keyboard direction, and it lent for some really different cool songs. And then um, Mark uh, Townsend, our guitar player for the union uh, for the J band, uh, J Secular band, and he and I've been around for eleven years together, eight to eleven. I I I, I lose count. A long time. A long time. Yeah. And uh, he knows me better than just about anyone else and knew my knew what kind of uh thing i was into i knew what he was into so it got to, we combined it came real natural when you released the album like we mentioned about a week before covid yes hit, yes when things finally started to settle down did you re-release it i mean did you try to make it a new project or did you just pick up where you left off not yet in fact it's really it really still is sort of shelved yeah because uh, uh, the uh, you know, Centered Saints album came out. Um, the the anniversary thing. I think I'm going to be busy with the 50th anniversary with Petra all year, at which I still want it. I'm hoping there's times where I can tour the the Go album I, with all my other stuff. That that includes Petra's material. That it's it's my life story com, uh, through my latest project. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, which is exciting. But you know, I've got I've got a documentary coming out, the, the, my own documentary, which is being pitched right now in Los Angeles. And if they, they're not interested, it'll probably be out uh, 
uh, in one way or another. Not to mention there's stuff going on with Petra that I think everybody's going to be very excited about. So it's funny, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be retired. I'm supposed to be sitting in a chair, you know, at my age, I'm supposed to be sitting in a chair and rocking away. I just don't, uh, the only walk I do is on stage. Yeah. And uh, I'm very excited about the fact that God's opening all these doors. It uh, keeps me feeling like I'm still relevant and uh, making a difference uh, in uh, in God's path for us all. So let me ask you this, 50 years, mm-hmm. does it still feel as good today on stage as it did back then? Oh, absolutely. I, if, if nothing else, I wish that I could be, I could do it more often so I could get back in shape. I'm not very disciplined. So it's not like I go out and practice singing every day, you know, but I would love to be able to be on stage more often, get back more in shape and, and have, a, have the fun that I've always had. I'm, um, I would call myself a Christian gypsy. I'm, I'm a musical gypsy. I really like, and what's funny is my, my family totally accepts it. We've, we have a, a family that totally supports everything I do. Uh, well, that's, and that's the only way you could do it. As a Christian, that's, that's the only way you could be a, a Christian artist, and that is if your family is totally 100% behind it. And you're a rarity in that aspect in that you and your wife have been married a long time. 50, going on 52 years this year. That's very unusual. And whether it's Christian or secular, the music business, you don't see a lot of that. Well, that just shows that God knew what he was doing when he put my wife in my face. Yeah. And listen, I, and I fought it. You know, I, uh, for the first 10 years of our marriage, I was the biggest jerk in the world. I spent the last 40 years trying to make up to her. What's next for you? Are you thinking about uh, another project on top of everything else you're doing? Or just you got a full plate as it I, is? I've got a full plate. Yeah. I, I think uh, as far as uh, next record, until the go gets a chance, I don't want to, I don't like wasting. Yeah. And on top of that, like I said, I keep mentioning Jay Secular Band. We, we may end up doing a record. That, uh, that band is amazing. Um, uh, the Union Centers and Saints, we're we're having fun together. Um, again, uh, the team I got together for the uh, for the Go record, still want still want to get together with those guys. And then Petra, I mean Petra is uh, is happening at least probably for the next couple of years. So um, I'm um, I'm not complaining, uh, but I just only have so many so many days of the year to to work on. How can people find you, your music? your tour dates, all that good stuff. Just Google John Schlitt.com uh, or John W. Schlitt.com. Uh, I'm working on a website that uh, we just built a new one, but we're having problems getting it connected. So every time I go to it, it's either the old one or the new one. I would like to have the new one up because I think it tells a little bit more, looks a little more current, but the old one, old one keeps popping back in and it's so cool. It's cool too. So it's John W. Schlitt.com or John Schlitt.com. And, and just it, it talks about my, uh, my ministry, which is Build It Ministries, and, and uh, uh, my touring, um, my family, my extracurricular activities like my woodworking and all that. So, And that's something we didn't touch base on, and, and I'd like to for a moment if you sure. don't mind. And that's your, your uh, 501c3, your, your Build It Ministries. Yes. Can we go down that road for I a minute? I would love to. I, I have been very blessed through the years. With Petra, even with Head East, I, I, was, I was given an opportunity to learn how to be a front man later for Petra with Head East. Uh, it, did it cost me almost my life? But God knew what he was doing. And as time went on, uh, I have more time on my hands now. Like I, like I said, I'm not touring as much as I'd like to. But in that time period, I felt like I, I don't like to waste time. And God opened up some doors for me to be able to help other people. My vision for Build It Ministries initially was I was going to go out and do free concert for churches. They were going to charge money for the concert and do and use that money to help, like put new roofs on a on a church or this kind of thing. And the churches just didn't see that vision. So um, I started helping individuals that uh, um, that. Other that they slip slip through the cracks, you know they actually they're too successful. 
Uh, like one, the one lady, uh, she had a business of her own, got sick, almost lost the business. And meanwhile, her home is degenerating. Uh, and uh, uh, So I went in and the ministry went in and um, replaced her heating and air conditioning, her stove, her dish, dishwasher, put on a new deck in the back, uh, rebuilt uh, an apartment that had de- de- degenerated or, you know, pretty much was was uninhabitable Un- yes and now she's able to rent it and just that kind of stuff and then there's a a young man who got in a traffic accident and was it, actually officially died came out of it but has had a little bit of a brain damage and is struggling with getting work and and trying to get disability i'm working with him right now just stuff like that 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 there isn't like a super cause but it's it comes across my path and i'm able to help only because of generous people who, who believe that if they, if they have extra money and they give it to me, I'm going to use it the best I possibly can. How can they donate that money to this cause, to the Build It Ministry? Probably the best way, again, is to go to and uh, or, or go to uh, um, Build It Ministries. I would go to johnschlitt.com, johnwschlitt.com. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, Bob, it, it's been my pleasure, buddy. Thank you. Uh, I've been like I said, we've been trying to do this forever, and finally we're able to all fit together. And I, I do thank you for being interested in uh, in what I do, what Petra does, what to, um, because it gets the word out, and they can they can see that if if our ministry, our our what we do, can fit in and help others, let's do it. Absolutely.